The Secret Pact by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. The Secret Pact by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. Chapter One Aboard the Good Time. A blanket of fog, thick and damp, swirled about the decks of the excursion steamer Good Time, cautiously plying its course down the river. At intervals, above the steady throb of the ship's engines, a foghorn sounded its mournful warning to small craft. "'I hope we don't collide with another boat before we make the dock,' remarked Louise Seidel, who stood at the railing with her chum, Penelope Parker." that would be a perfect ending for an imperfect day returned penny fitting her coat collar more snugly about her throat an imperfect day i'd call it a miserable one rain and fog fog and rain it's made my hair as straight as the shortest distance between two points mine's as kinky as wool impatiently penny brushed a ringlet of golden hair from her eyes well shall we go inside again no i'd rather freeze than be a wallflower the dark-eyed girl responded gloomily we haven't been asked to dance once this evening that's because we came without our own crowd lou except for that couple yonder we're practically the only persons aboard unattached to a group penny jerked her head in the direction of a young man and girl who slowly paced the deck earlier in the evening their peculiar actions had attracted her attention they kept strictly to themselves avoiding the salon the dining room and all contact with other excursionists i wonder who they are mused louise turning to stare the girl wears a veil as if she were afraid someone might recognize her yes i noticed that and whenever anyone goes near her she lowers her head i wish we could see her face let's wander over that way proposed louise arm in arm they sauntered toward the couple the young man saw them coming he touched his companion's arm and turning their backs they walked away they did that to avoid meeting us louise declared in an excited undertone now why i wonder the couple had reached the end of the deck as the young woman turned to glance over her shoulder a sudden gust of wind caught her hat before she could save it the headgear was swept dangerously close to the railing not giving the young man an opportunity to act penny darted forward rescuing the hat she carried it to the couple thank you the girl mumbled keeping her head lowered thank you very much quickly she jammed the felt hat on her head and replaced the veil but not before penny had seen her face clearly the young woman was unusually pretty with large brown eyes and a long smoothly brushed black bob this is certainly a miserable night penny remarked hoping to start a conversation sure is replied the young man with discouraging brevity he tipped his hat and steered his companion away from the girl ruefully penny returned to louise who had been an interested spectator did you get a good look at the pair she asked eagerly yes but i've never seen either of them before they wouldn't talk no and the girl lowered her veil as soon as she could perhaps she's a movie actress traveling in disguise aboard a river excursion boat i'm afraid not lou then maybe she's a criminal trying to elude the police i fear the mystery of her identity must remain forever unsolved chuckled penny we'll dock in another five minutes through the fog could be seen a dim glow of lights along the riverview wharf the good time its whistle tooting repeated signals was proceeding more slowly than ever sailors stood ready to make the vessel fast to the dock posts when she touched passengers began to pour from the salon and penny and louise joined the throng many persons pushed and jostled each other trying to obtain a position close to the gangplank suddenly a girl who stood not far from penny gave an alarmed cry my pocketbook it's gone 
Those near her expressed polite concern and assisted in searching the deck. The missing purse was not found. Before the captain could be notified, the gangplank was lowered and the passengers began to disembark from the steamer. The girl, whose pocketbook had been lost, remained by the railing quite forgotten. Tears streamed down her cheeks. "'Excuse me,' said Penny, addressing her. "'Is there anything I can do to help?' Disconsolately, the girl shook her head. She made a most unattractive picture, for her blouse was wrinkled and her skirt was spotted with an ugly coffee stain. Beneath a brown, misshapen, roll-brim hat hung a tangle of brown hair. "'Someone stole my pocketbook,' she said listlessly. "'I had twelve dollars in it, too.' "'You're sure you didn't leave it anywhere?' Louise inquired. "'No, I had it in my hand only a minute ago. I think someone lifted it in the crowd.' "'A pickpocket, no doubt,' Penny agreed. "'I've been told they frequent these river boats. "'Nearly everyone's left the steamer now, so I suppose it would do no good to notify the captain,' commented Louise." She and Penny started to turn away, then paused as they noticed that the girl remained in the same dejected posture. "'You have some friends meeting you at the boat?' Penny inquired kindly. "'I haven't any friends, not in Riverview.' "'None?' Penny asked in surprise. "'Don't you live here?' "'No,' answered the girl. "'I've been working as a waitress up at Flintville, upriver. The job played out last week. Today I took this boat thinking I might find work in Riverview. Now I've lost my person. I don't know what to do or where to go. Haven't you any money? inquired Penny. Not a cent. I I guess I'll have to sleep in the park tonight. No, you won't, declared Penny. Impulsively, she opened her own purse and, removing a five-dollar bill, thrust it into the girl's hand. This isn't much, but it may tide you over until you can find work. Oh, you're kind to help me. I'll pay you back just as soon as I get a job. Oh, don't worry about that, replied Penny. However, I should like to know your name. Tilly Fellows. Mine is Penelope Parker, and my friend is Louise Seidel. Well, good luck in finding that job. Edging away from Tilly, who would have detained them indefinitely, the girls crossed the gangplank to shore. "'You were generous to give a stranger five dollars, Penny,' commented Louise when they were beyond hearing. "'Oh, she needed it. Your allowance money, wasn't it?' "'Yes, but I couldn't allow the girl to go hungry or sleep in the park.' "'No, I suppose not,' replied Louise. Penny paused, scanning the crowd on the dock. Her father, Anthony Parker, had promised to meet the excursion boat, but there was no sign of him or his car. "'Dad must have been detained at the newspaper office,' she remarked. "'I suppose we must wait here until he comes.' Removing themselves from the stream of traffic, the girls walked a short distance along the dock, halting beside a warehouse. The throng rapidly dispersed, and still Mr. Parker did not arrive. I hope we haven't missed him, Penny remarked anxiously. In this fog, one can't see many yards. They had waited only a few minutes longer when Louise suddenly touched her chum's arm. Penny, there she is, alone, too. Who, Louise? Why, that girl whose hat you recovered on the good time. See her coming this way? Penny turned to stare at the young woman who was walking hurriedly along the dock. At first glance, she was inclined to agree with Louise that it was the same girl. Then she was uncertain. The one who approached wore an expensive fur and carried a distinctive beaded bag. "'I don't believe I ever saw her before,' she commented. "'I guess I was mistaken,' admitted Louise. "'She's too well-dressed.' Apparently, the girl did not observe Penny and her chum, for she passed them without a glance." Hurriedly, she walked a short distance down the wharf. Then, with a deft movement, she took a package from beneath her smart-fitting coat and tossed it into the water. Turning, she retraced her steps to the gangplank of the good time. A moment later, the girl saw her meet a young man in top coat and derby who had emerged from the crowd on the dock. Entering a gray sedan, they drove away. "'I 
wonder what she threw into the river," mused Penny. "Didn't you think she acted as if she were afraid someone would see her, Lou?" "Yes, I did. Whatever it was, it's gone to the bottom of the river." "Curious." The girls walked to the edge of the dock. Penny glanced over the side and gave an excited cry. Instead of falling into the water, the package had caught fast on a jagged dock post. "It's hanging by the string!" she exclaimed. Eagerly, Louise peered down. "You're right," she agreed. "But we can't get it." "I'm going to try." "Please don't," pleaded Louise. "It's too far down. You'll tumble into the water." "Not if you sit on my heels." Undisturbed by what anyone who saw her might think, Penny stretched flat on the dock. With Louise holding on to her, she jackknifed over the edge, clutching at the bundle which was dangling an inch above the water. "'Got it!' she chuckled. "'Haul away, Lou!' Louise pulled her friend to safety. Eagerly, they examined the package, which was wrapped in ordinary newspaper. "'I'll venture it contains nothing more than the remains of a lunch,' declared Louise. "'This is going to be a good joke on you, Penny.' "'A joke?' quavered Penny. Her gaze had focused upon a hole in the paper. Through the opening protruded a long strand of dark hair. Louise saw it at the same instant and uttered a choked, horrified scream. "'Human hair!' she gasped. "'Oh, Penny, turn it over to the police!' "'It can't be that,' said Penny in a calmer voice. With trembling fingers, she untied the string. The paper fell away, and several objects dropped at Penny's feet. Stooping, she picked up a girl's long black wig. In addition, there was a dark veil, a crushed felt hat, and a cheap cloth jacket. "'A disguise!' exclaimed Louise. "'Yes, the girl who tossed this bundle into the river was the same one we saw aboard the steamer. "'But why did she wear these things and then try to get rid of them?' "'Why, Penny, don't you understand?' Louise demanded impressively. "'She was a crook, just as I thought, and she must have been the one who robbed Tilly Fellows.'" End of chapter 1